I have a story to tell you today about an old leader who led a nation and who was going to climb a mountain and die. And before he was going to climb the mountain and die, he had to appoint a successor. He had to tell the nation, this is the person who's going to lead the nation after I'm gone. So that's the story I'm going to tell you today. This story happened about 3,500 years ago. So it's a very old story, historically true. And it didn't happen in North America, it happened in the Middle East. It actually, this story didn't happen in the land of Israel per se either. This story happened just east of Israel, across the Jordan River, in this area that was kind of deserty and uh, it was full of big craggy hills. If you're, from, if you're from the prairies like Saskatchewan, you would definitely call them mountains. And uh, they called them mountains also. So I'll tell you this story. It's from a book. Uh, of the scriptures that in Hebrew is called Bamidbar. That means in the desert. Why? Because these are stories that happened in the desert. In Greek it's called Arithmoi, which is translated as Numbers. So it's from the book of Numbers, chapter 27. So in this story, Yahweh, the creator of the universe, speaks to his prophet Moses, whom he used to lead the nation of Israel out of Egypt in probably the most spectacular rescue operation ever and then through whom he gave them a, a lot of teachings and laws to uh, show them his ways and to make their lives better. So Moses at this time was about 120 years old. He was an old guy. He was probably really tanned from being out in the desert. He probably had really big crinkles around his eyes. His hair was probably white. And he had led the nation for 40 years. And he always spoke to him and said, I want you to climb this mountain. And in Hebrew, this mountain is called Avarim. Everybody say Avarim. Avarim. In English, they translate it Avarim. Do you know what that actually means? It means crossings over. It means transitions. So he said, I want you to climb this mountain called crossings over, called transitions. And from there, I'm going to show you all the land of Israel that I'm giving as a land grant to the people of Israel and then you're going to die. You're not going to be able to go into the land that I'm giving to Israel because you rebelled against me. Remember that, and you, of course you remember the story where uh, Yahweh told Moses, I want you to go and I want you to speak to this rock in front of the whole nation and it's going to crack open and water is going to come out of it for them to drink so that they don't die of dehydration. And Moses, he was actually quite angry with the people because they were just being a bunch of miserable complainers. And they were just really getting on Moses and Aaron's nerves. And to top it all off, Moses and Aaron's sister Miriam had just died too, so they probably weren't feeling so great, right? So guess what happened in that story? Instead of speaking to the rock, Moses took his stick and he whacked the rock. And he didn't just whack it once, he whacked it twice. And sure enough, water gushed out. But God spoke to Moses and said, Moses, you didn't believe me. You didn't treat me as holy in front of all these people. And so you don't get to go into the land of Israel. So this is what Yahweh says to Moses. And do you know what Moses responded? Moses responded by saying, Oh, God of the breath of all flesh, please choose a new leader for the nation. Appoint a man over the community so that he can go in and out before the people and lead them in and out. And so that they won't be like a bunch of sheep without a shepherd. That's what Moses prayed. And Yahweh, Yahweh answered and said, I want you to take Joshua. In Hebrew, his name is Yehoshua. Everybody say Yehoshua. Yeah, in Hebrew, it's more like people just say Yehoshua. He said, take Yehoshua, the son of Nun. The spirit is in him. And I want you to stand in front of the whole community of Israel, along with Eliezer, the high priest. And I want you to lay your hand, everybody say hand, notice that little detail, on Yoshua, and I want you to commission him. I want you to make it obvious to everyone that he's the new leader that I am appointing to lead the people. And I want you to take some of the authority that's on you, like the verbal authority, and put it on him so that everybody will listen to Joshua and obey him. And then Joshua, he's going to stand before Eliezer the priest when there's a decision to make. And Eliezer the priest will ask God the yes or no question. 
and then he'll tell Joshua whether God says yes or no. And then the nation will listen to Joshua and they'll listen to Eliezer the high priest who's speaking on my behalf. That is essentially what God said to, uh, in answer to Moses. So, guess what Moses did? That's exactly what he did, except for one little detail. He, he, he took Joshua, he stood him in front of the whole nation, and he laid his hands, it says in Hebrew, on Joshua. And he, um, the Hebrew is like tzav, it means to commission, or to give a command, or a, a charge, or a mission. But that's what he did for Joshua, in front of all the people, they all watched it happen. And with Eliezer, the high priest there also. So that's the story from God's word for us today. It's from the readings that our community is on this week. And I want to ask you some questions and just think about this story with you and see what God might have to teach e each one of us from this story and also to teach us as a community. So the first question that I have for you today is, uh, what do you like about this story? Is there anything you really like about it? Maybe you like how Moses was, he really cared about Israel, even though like they really made him mad every now and then. And they were really a sorry lot of people sometimes. I mean, oh, he, he, they almost got themselves killed. They almost got Moses killed. He still cared about them. You know, his first, his first thought was, oh God, I want to go into Israel. You know, he just cared about them. Maybe, maybe you like that. Um, maybe you like how Moses didn't just take one of his hands on Joshua. He took both of his hands and he just wholeheartedly gave him that, that mission. Or here's another question to you. Is there anything about this story that maybe bothers you a little bit? Maybe you felt sad just to hear that Moses, after all of that hard work and after toughing it out in the desert for 40 years, he doesn't get to go into Israel. He has to die in the desert. I mean, he spent so much time in the desert already. Maybe that bothers you a little or makes you feel sad. I don't know. Maybe there are other things in the story that you like or, or dislike. Here's another question. Who in the story can you relate to? Have you had experiences in this story that were similar to um, the experiences of any of these people? Maybe you can um, relate to Moses, uh, realizing that you did something in your life that had consequences that stopped you from going somewhere that you wanted to go or that God had for you. I think maybe we all feel regret sometimes when we look at our pasts and we see times when we disobeyed God and it didn't go so well. Uh, maybe you can relate to, to uh, Moses as being an older leader, someone who has had influence. Or maybe you had, a, you had a job and it was time for you to move on and you needed to pass that baton on to a younger leader. You needed to find someone who would take over for you. Maybe you can relate to that. Um, maybe you can relate to Joshua as a younger person who has been mentored by someone or who has learned so much by someone and the time comes when that person says, it's time for you to step up to the plate. It's time for you to have a bit more responsibility. How did you feel? Maybe that, maybe that kind of scared you. Maybe that was a little terrifying. I don't know. Um, maybe you can relate to Eliezer the high priest. He didn't have like a big public role in the story, but he was a guy that was really close to God. And he was a guy that people would go to for advice. The, Moses, the leader of the nation, Joshua, the leader of the nation, they would go to the high priest and they would ask for advice. They'd say, what is God saying to do? And Eliezer would give them that advice that they needed. Or maybe you can relate to the, the people of Israel, where there's just this transition and uh, you're saying, we need someone that's going to that's gonna take us where we need to go. We need someone with vision. We need someone that can tell us what God is saying. Maybe you can relate to the people of Israel in some of those feelings. Quite frankly, I can relate to all of those guys at times in my life. And maybe there are other people in the story, but I can't think of anyone else that maybe you can relate to. So those are, those are some people that I think we have life experiences that we can relate to in the story. So I'm going to ask you a couple of questions now um, for us to think about. Um, here's, here's a that, that are going to go like this. Like, what does this story tell us about people in general, about human beings? Uh, what does this story tell us about leaders? Because this is a story about an old leader and a young leader. Then we're going to look at what this story has to tell us about God and about God's Messiah, who actually had the same name as Joshua. Ho ho! That's going to be interesting. So what does this story tell us about people? Uh, one of the things this story tells us about people is that we need, need someone to lead us. In fact, this story tells us that like, we're like, we're like sheep. And quite frankly, for someone to tell me that I'm like a sheep, I find that a bit insulting at first. Because if you've ever like watched a bunch of sheep or if you've ever studied, uh, let's say, sheep psychology, the way sheep act, um, they're not very smart animals. 
Like if you leave them on their own, they'll kind of start wandering all over the place. And this one will get slaughtered by a pack of coyotes. Uh, that one will get lost and maybe die of dehydration. Another one will end up on its back, stuck between two rocks, buying until it dies. I mean, really, um, did you ever notice that there aren't a lot of wild sheep out there? They're like, there are feral horses, you know, like wild horses that run around. There are feral donkeys, like wild donkeys. But there just aren't any wild sheep because they're just too dumb and they just die. They don't make it, right? But something that this story tells us is that we as individuals are like sheep and we as communities are like sheep. Like, so we need a leader. Without a leader, we just kind of wander off and do stupid things and get slaughtered and scatter. Those are the kinds of things that, that we as human beings do. And that, this is something that this story tells us. And uh, we'll look more about the ultimate leader that God gave to his people in a couple of minutes. But that, that's a couple of things that uh, this story tells us about people. Now, this story is, a, is, is primarily about an old leader and a younger leader. So maybe we could ask the question, what does this story tell us about leaders? And uh, as you know, there's kind of like, kind of the whole concept of leadership. It's kind of like this big trendy thing in the world today. Uh, leader, leadership, it's kind of, they're kind of like buzzwords, eh? And uh, if you know me, you know that I really don't like trends. Like, I'm not the kind of person to jump on bandwagons. I, it's like, if, if something's popular, I'll like go the other direction. Just because I, I don't know, I'm kind of like a sheep, but sometimes I'm more like a goat. And I like to just go and do my own thing and run around like a, like a billy goat, that kind of thing, eh? So we're going to talk a little bit about leaders, and I don't want you to get turned off to this just because you're like, oh, that's so trendy. Oh, I don't want to hear it. No, this is something in the scriptures. This is a really old idea. But we're going to see what the scriptures have to teach us about this because it is a little different than what, let's say, the corporate business world has to say today about leadership. Maybe some of you, like maybe you, Megan, maybe you're like, I'm not a leader. What, does, what, would, what would this have to teach me? But here's the thing. Actually, every one of us are a leader. Because do you know what a leader is? A leader is someone who influences the people around them. What that means is like a, a leader is someone who gets people thinking a certain way or gets people doing certain things or gets people talking a certain way, using certain words. Maybe sometimes leaders even get people listening to certain music, wearing certain clothes, all those kinds of things. That's what leaders do. And let me ask you, does, are there any of you that don't have any influence on anyone else? My guess is no. And here's the crazy thing. Most of us influence the people around us, but we never realize it. And they'll never tell us, because really, like, who wants to be like, yeah, you know, you've really influenced me in this area. Yeah, you've really changed me in that, this area. Yeah. Um, okay, I'll give, you, I'll give you a couple examples from my relationship with my youngest brother, Colin. Uh, my youngest brother, Colin, I really love him. He's really spunky, and he has a lot of uh, flair for life. And uh, he's really, he's got, he's got, me, he got me doing things that I would never otherwise do because sometimes I'm lady, lazy and sometimes I'm just not adventurous. So like, I, I used to not like swimming because I just don't like being cold. And usually when you jump in the water, it's cold, right? But my brother Colin loved swimming. And so somewhere along the way, he kind of got me, he influenced me to swim more and to like jump in the water and swim. Because, you know, he'd be in the water and be having fun and be like, oh, maybe that does look kind of fun. Okay, maybe, maybe I'll jump in the water too. Yeah. Or um, I could tell you lots of little examples from, from my brother Colin, but that would be an e example of how he influenced me. I love swimming now. I jump in the water all the time, sometimes even with all my clothes on if I don't have a swimsuit, just because I love it. And so I could say, my brother influenced me in that little way. And I guarantee you that you've influenced hundreds and hundreds of people in little ways over the course of your life. Even Megan or, uh, or, or, or some of you that are like, uh, let's say, uh, children or in your teens or whatever. And if I were to ask you, how many people have influenced you in your life? How many people could you, would you be able to say have influenced you? Maybe you'd count like five or ten people on your fingers. You know, the people that have most inspired you or, or taught you things. But if you were to actually think about all of the people that influenced what you do, there are a bunch of them that you've never even met before. Like, for instance, if you grew up going to an evangelical church, then you were probably influenced in the way you look at evangelism by some men like D.L. Moody and Charles Finney. Have you ever met them? 
Probably not because they lived like over 100 years ago. And I don't think any of us here are that old. So those would just be a couple examples. The way most evangelicals look at evangelism was influenced by a couple dead guys who haven't actually been around for a long time. So that, those would be a couple, that's kind of trying to get us thinking about being a leader in the bigger sense of the word. So we can ask ourselves, what does this story teach us about leaders? about people who influence other people. And of course, of course Moses was a very uh, high profile, uh, great example of that. But you know, we each are in our own sphere of influence also. Um, we'll just look through this story and we'll notice some things. Uh, firstly, we see that leaders are mountain climbers. Leaders like to climb mountains. Why? Because the mountain is there. And because the view from the top is fantastic. You can see a long way from the top of a mountain. When you're on the ground, how far can you see here? Not very far, eh? But if you were to climb a tree, you could see a little bit farther. If you were to get a crane here, like they had at the, or some kind of ride like they had at the exhibition, you could probably see the whole city. And that's the idea. Leaders climb mountains so that they can get the big picture, so they can see really far. And uh, did you notice Moses had a habit of mountain climbing? He climbed up Mount Sinai, and there he encountered God, and God revealed himself to him. Here Moses is going to climb another mountain of transitions, and he's going to see the whole land of Israel. So that's, uh, have any of you tried to live on top of a mountain, though? Yeah, do you know why? Because you can't. People who, like, try and live on top of mountains usually die, because... It's really crazy cold though sometimes on mountains. There's storms, uh, there's not much for drinking water, and there's just no food. So something I think that we can all learn from Moses is like there's a time to climb the mountain, and that's a time sometimes where we're just all of a sudden we're like, wow, I have a huge flash of insight, or I'm totally inspired. Or you just have one of those aha moments and you realize something really big, and that's cool. But it won't last, right? It's like you're on the mountaintop, and then you know you have to come down after a while and kind of be back on the ground. What's the key? Remember what you saw from the mountaintop and then maybe you go on to implement that in your life, right? To do, it's kind of like you realize something, but then the big challenge is to go ahead and do it, eh? Kind of change your lifestyle, uh, make a new set of habits. That's where sometimes it can get challenging. Another thing we see about leaders from this story is leaders are going somewhere. Did you notice that? Moses, when he came to the people in Egypt, he wasn't like, hey guys, I'm here. I'm just here to hang out with you for the next 40 years because I really don't have anywhere else to be. No, he was like, guys, God sent me here to take you somewhere. We are going to go on a journey. So we're going to go from point A to point B, right? And that's, that's something about leaders that's really huge. Leaders are going somewhere. And sometimes that's hard for us in the community because quite frankly, most of us don't like change. Have you noticed that? For most of us, we kind of like to get in our groove. We have our system. It's usually pretty comfortable. We kind of have our, the way things are set up and we just do them every week or every day and we don't really think about it because we're totally creatures of habit. We are like routine animals. And then someone comes and they're like, we need to change things. We need to leave this place and go on. We need to go somewhere. And we're like, no, no, go away, go away. We don't want to change. We don't want to go anywhere, right? That, that's us as human beings. So when God like, gives communities leaders, they will make us uncomfortable. They will sometimes make us kick and scream a little bit because they're hyper and because they can kind of see from the top of the mountain and because they're able to say, guys, we can't stay here. We've got to keep going. We haven't arrived at the destination yet. So that's something that we see from the story. There's a time to set a camp and be comfy, and there's a time to pick up camp and to move and to change and to trust our leaders that God gives us when those times come. Uh, something else we see in this story, and this is really tough, is God holds leaders to high standards. Did you notice that? One time. Moses disobeyed God one time. And he only kind of disobeyed God because the first time around with the rock, God did say, whack the rock with your stick. The second time around, God said, speak to the rock. It wasn't the hugest difference, eh? But Moses disobeyed one time and God said, Moses, you didn't treat me as holy in front of everybody. You didn't believe me. You're not going into the land of Israel. Ouch. There's actually something similar that Yeshua, his, he had a little brother named Yaakov, in English people call him James. He said, he said, you there shouldn't be a lot of you that want to become teachers because they're going to get judged more strictly. They'll be held to a higher standard. 
So, you know, sometimes people, we like to look at people and be like, wow, that person is kind of front and center. That person gets a lot of attention. Maybe that person is something of a celebrity. I wish I could be like that. Sometimes we look at people and we feel a little jealous. Sometimes pastors will look at, let's say, mega church pastors, and they'll be like, wow, I wish I could be that. They forget that that's a really, really tough job description. And God's holding people like that to really, really high standards. It can be very painful sometimes. For Moses, it was very painful. It wasn't an easy thing. Something else we see from the story is that leaders are big picture thinkers. There are a couple places we see this. Like when Moses climbed the mountain and he saw the whole land of Israel, that was a pretty big picture right there, hey? But there was an, there's, another, there's another thing where we really get that feeling. Did you notice what Moses called God when he prayed to him? He didn't just say, Yahweh, please appoint a man over the community. He said, let the God of the breath of all flesh appoint a man over the community. It was like, what, what does that mean? Can we think about that for a sec? What does it tell us about God? He is like, and there are two ways that you could read that. Like in, um, in Hebrew, like the word for breath is ruchot, and it means spirit or breath. And then the word for flesh is basar. Everybody say basar. That's like, you know, your physical side. It's also the word for meat. Kind of gives you a bigger picture of it. But Moses had this picture of God that w God just wasn't just the God of Israel. God wasn't just this localized God in the desert with a couple million nomadic people camping out in tents. He was like the God who gave life to everybody on the planet. All those people back in Egypt. He was the God who gave, who gave life to them. He was the God who was giving breath to everybody in the land of Canaan where they were going. That's a pretty big picture of God, isn't it? Um, there's, one, there's one translation that renders that phrase as, he's the source of all life. So can you see how Moses was thinking big there? He didn't just have this little idea of God. He had this huge picture of God. And uh, I think that's something we really need as disciples of Yeshua today also. Because quite often, we like to build our little worlds where we, that are in control, and then we don't like to look beyond the, the, like those little worlds, eh? We like to kind of build our little re religious ghettos often where we're comfortable and everybody's like us, and then we never leave those ghettos, and we never go out and interact with other people who are different than us. But when you see, when you see the men and women who have really made an impact in the world for the kingdom of God and who have influenced people towards Yeshua, they always had this big picture of God. They had this, they had this like huge idea of God's kingdom. So I'll give you an example here in Prince Albert. Like we have our little circle of people who are following Yeshua. But he's way bigger than that in the city. And yeah, we're, we're in God's kingdom and God's kingdom is in our midst here. But it's way bigger than that. Like there are people in this park right now and God is speaking to those people. God is doing stuff in their hearts because he's everywhere. Because he's huge. Because he made the place, eh? And so start to get that picture of God. And quite often, they'll be like, maybe do you have someone in your neighborhood that just kind of scares you? Someone that's really different than you? Someone that like, I don't know, isn't the kind of person you'd normally talk with? And maybe you'd be like, that person, that's the really bad person on her black. That is the person that's like really not spiritual. That's the person who probably, I don't know, maybe they listen to ACDC and when the song about um, the highway to hell comes on, they crank it up. Maybe it's that person, right? But a big picture of God will tell you God is talking to that person too. God is probably doing something in their life. Because he's everywhere. And he loves everybody, eh? So when you begin to think that way, you leave the religious ghetto behind and you begin to just look at people for who they are and love them for who they are. And not feel like you have to have an agenda with everybody. Um, there's this really cool line. I really love this line. It's something that Paul wrote, one of Yeshua's, uh, one of Yeshua's uh, like emissaries, apostles. He said, God is the savior of everybody and especially of believers. Does that mean everybody's going to be in paradise? No. What that means is God is helping everyone. God is getting everybody out of tight spots. God has rescued everybody at times. And especially those of us who actually believe in him and who want him in our lives. That's a big picture, isn't it? So look at your neighbors, look at your coworkers, look at the people in the city and say, God is, God is helping them. God is rescuing them. God is speaking to them. And it'll give you this bigger picture, right? And I guarantee you, it'll, give you, it'll make you a more influential person in your community. Uh, something else we see in this story about Moses is he like, he was really selfless. Like he actually cared about pe like the people that he was leading, even though they were a horrible bunch of people and really grumpy more than he even cared about himself. 
that's really touching. Um, another thing we see in this story about leaders, um, and this, this is, this is um, you'd call this an idiom. It's kind of like one of those expressions in a language that you don't really use in another language. Did you notice there was this expression to like, go out and come in before the people? What does that mean? What does it mean to go out and come in before the people? Well, that is a Hebrew idiom. And uh, what it means basically is just to lead people. Uh, specifically, it's talking about if you are the leader of a nation, you're also expected to be the general of the army. So if the nation is going to go to battle, guess who's going to be right at the front of the army, marching towards the, the enemy lines? It's going to be you. So that's, that's generally the, that's where that idiom comes from. It's like you're going out in front of the army, you're leading the army, and then hopefully when you win the victory and you trump the enemy, then you're the one who brings everybody back home. So that's what it means kind of to go out and in before, before, the, uh, before the people, eh? And um, this is really interesting. I'll just, I'll, just, I'll just read this to you, like where Moses is praying. He says, May Yahweh, the God of the spirits of all flesh, appoint a man over the community who will go out and come in before them and who will bring them out and bring them in. What? Did that, did that sound redundant? Did it sound like he just said the same thing twice? No. The first time he said, Joshua is going to go in and out before the people, and then he said, he's going to bring them in and out. So it kind of has this idea that Joshua, as a leader, was going to live his life in front of the nation. He was a public figure, and uh, you could, maybe you could say that Joshua was going to be a transparent individual. He would live his life in the public eye. Joshua was going to be available. Did you notice that about Moses? Like, when he led everybody out of Egypt, he wasn't like, hey guys, you know, I'm going to go take a break now. I'm just going to go have some spiritual time in the wilderness. I'll be back at the end of the day. Uh, if you have problems, just work them out yourselves. You're supposed to be a bunch of big kids by now, eh? He didn't do that. He just sat down. He's like, hey guys, you know, I'm here for you. Um, people would come to him and they'd be like, blah, 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 this person did that. And he would help them work through it. And he did that like all day long, every day. He was really available to people. He lived a very transparent life. And uh, that's something that I think is a fantastic thing for us to do. Why? Because that's how you're going to influence people. If people can see the way you live your life, that's going to that's influence them. If people see... Hmm, I'll, give, I'll give you some practical examples. If people can like, um, see how you relate to your family. If people can see what kind of things you post on Facebook. Stuff like that. It's going to influence people. Yeah. And you totally see that in the lives of Moses and Joshua. So that's why I, for instance, like, I don't really hide out. I, I, try and, I try and be a transparent person. Even when I'm doing talks, like I talk about problems that I'm dealing with or weaknesses of mine or stories where I was just really stupid or I was a jerk or whatever. You know, I tell you those stories because I want to be the kind of person who goes out and comes in before us as a community, eh? I want to be a really transparent individual. Uh, that's also why I'm on all the social media things like, like on Facebook and Twitter. And you guys aren't going to believe this. I got on Pinterest this last week. Are any of you guys on Pinterest? It's kind of like, it's this like new popular thing where it's kind of like you can post pictures or links onto your boards and uh, it's very pop. It's, it's, it's more popular with, with girls, but it's also an excellent way of sharing news and sharing stuff that's going on in your life. So, you know, I'm on all those things and I post regularly because I want to be one of those people that are available and that are transparent. I want to share my life with anybody who is interested in kind of sharing the journey together, eh? So that's, uh, that's something that we see in the story. Not exactly that Joshua was on Facebook, Twitter, or Pinterest, but, uh, but that idea that he went in and he, he went out before the people. There's another side to that too. To go in and out before the people, that was the first part, and then to bring them in and out. Did you hear that? So Joshua isn't asking the nation to do anything that he's not doing himself. He's not saying, okay, guys, uh, you need to go over there and fight that battle, and I'm going to go have some lemonade, and I'll catch you at the end of the day, and you can tell me how it went. No, Joshua, he like went ahead of everybody, right? So if they were going to go out, he would go in front of them. And I think that's awesome. Just that like Joshua lived his life as an example, and then maybe even more than people listening to what he had to say, they just followed his example. They went where he was going. That's very powerful, something that we see in this story. Uh, we also see in this story that Joshua, as a young leader, was a man who was really in touch with God's Spirit. I don't think it says this about anyone else in the Tanakh, like in the history of Israel. Um, there are times when we would say the Spirit of Yahweh would fall on a man like Samson, and then they would do crazy things. 
or Saul would be another example. I think Joshua is the only man in the Tanakh that says that God's spirit was actually inside of him. It's like Joshua spent a ton of time in God's presence. Joshua was a man who was saturated with God's spirit. He was really close with his creator. It's kind of the idea there. Uh, we also see in the story that um, Joshua, as a young leader, this wasn't just Moses' idea. Moses was, wasn't like, well, you know, I really like Joshua. You know, we spent a, long, a lot of time together. He's my buddy, so I think I'm going to appoint him. No, like, Joshua became the leader of the nation because God called him, and then God chose him, eh? And uh, I, think this is, I think this is a big thing. Like, even in the Hebrew Roots movement or in the Messianic Jewish world, like, our job as communities it isn't to appoint leaders. Our job is just to say, God, who are you pouring your spirit out on? Who are, you, who are you speaking to? Who are you giving to us to influence us as communities, to show us your way, to give us some vision? Because those are the people that God is giving as leaders. Those are the people that God... You know, it's in, and, and either someone has been called by God or they haven't, right? There are some people that are just... They were called in their teens or they were called uh, at whatever age to like to to teach or to lead in a certain capacity or or whatever right and our job as community is just to say who are those people and then to trust god's leadership through them so that's something that this this story tells us it's just a matter of finding those people recognizing them you can also we can also see in this story that joshua is the national leader he didn't just kind of go off by himself and make all the decisions by himself did you notice in the story it says that he would go to Eleazar to Eleazar the high priest and he would confer with Eleazar he would get God's advice through Eleazar so you know for all of us like what does that mean for us what that means is just like don't make decisions on your own all the time don't be super independent if you have a big decision to make you know have a couple friends who are who are spiritually connected and who are pretty wise and uh, Ask their advice, you know, just bounce stuff off of them. That is um, something that this story, this story would, uh, would teach us, eh? And quite frankly, for some of us, that's really tough because we like to just do our thing. And uh, like, it's kind of like scary when you ask someone's advice because what if they say, I don't think that's a good idea. Or, well, what about this angle that you haven't thought about, eh? But that's the idea. That's why it's smart. So, you know, like for me as a leader of our community, I have people that I bounce stuff off of. I, I, have, I have men that are mentoring me. I have guys that I ask advice of, right? I, I don't want to be the kind of guy who just goes off and does his own thing. Uh, may I have, may I have uh, some water, possibly? <clears throat> um, the last thing that this story teaches us about leaders is that leaders die. Every leader has an expiration date, thank you, Teresa, on his or her forehead, and they're not going to be around forever. So for all of us, as people who are influential, we want to be asking ourselves, what's going to happen when I'm gone? What are we going to do if I can't be here anymore? And hopefully we're, all, we're like encouraging people, we're giving people chances to do what we do, we're, we're finding people who have passions like ours and then encouraging them. Uh, the whole idea of mentoring, hey, that's really big. Ah, cheers. So that's, that's the last thing that this story tells us. That like, there's, there's a time, like we, we, hopefully we're, all, we're looking for people that we can do life with, that we can you know, share with, that we can pour our lives into. Um, if we're younger people, hopefully we're looking for someone who can, who can share their lives with us, who can, who can share their experience and their wisdom, who can, who can mentor us even. Um, from my observations, usually someone will not come to you and say, you know, I would like to mentor you. You've got to go to that older person and say, could we do coffee every now and then? Could, wait, would you mind if we kind of shared our journeys a little bit? I'd like to learn from you. Or, you know, just if you're in a tight spot and maybe you need some advice, don't wait for like an older person to call you and give you advice. Call that person up and be like, this is, my exp this is, this is the tight spot I'm in. What would you do? What have you learned about this, eh? So that's something that, that this story teaches us. It's kind of cool too how like Moses, he made it very clear, made it very clear. Like he, he did this thing, he, you know, when he, when he gave Joshua the mission, he did it publicly, he did it with a ceremony, and he made it official. There's something very powerful about that. Like for, for those of us who are mentoring other people, to reach a point where you do something like in a ceremony, where you do something publicly, and you say, you are stepping into a new season of your life. You have a new set of responsibilities. God is calling you to this, and I just want to say that I'm behind you 100%. I'm not just going to put one hand on you. 
I'm going to put both of my hands on you and just tell you that I'm backing you with everything I've got. That kind of idea. Um, you know how in the, in the, in the Hebrew tradition, when a, when a young man reaches the age of 13, or a young lady reaches the age of 12, that's what we do, right? In the Jewish world, that's called a bar mitzvah or a bat mitzvah. But that's the idea. It's the father saying to his son, son, like, you know, I have been teaching you, I've been mentoring you, and you are entering into a new season of your life. And I just want to say that I'm backing you 100% and, and go for it. You know, and the same thing with a, with a young lady when her mother says that to her at the age of 12. That's a very powerful ceremony. So we see, a, we see something similar in here. Um, Two more questions for us in this, from the story. What does the story tell us about God? And what does this story tell us about the Messiah who happens to have the same name as Joshua? The story tells us a couple things about God that are a bit stark. Uh, this story tells us that God is holy and he expects that we'll treat him as holy or sometimes our lives just crash and burn. Have you ever noticed that? Like, so maybe, you're, maybe there's some area of your life and it's just crashed and burned and it's horrible. And like the first thing you want to do is blame somebody on the ground. But when you really stop and think about it, it's like, wait a minute, you know what? Back then, I kind of like started playing fast and loose with God. I kind of started having a 50%, I'd given 50% in our relationship. I just straight out disobeyed him, whatever the case may be. And no wonder my life is so, ugh, right now. I, I'll share an example from my life with you. Um, in 2007, God told me to start teaching Hebrew classes around our province. It's what ultimately led to us moving to Prince Albert and uh, starting this community. And guess what? I didn't do it. It was like in the fall of 2007, and I had some other stuff going. I was like going to start a business with alterna doing alternative energy stuff, and I ended up working with the guy installing high-speed internet. And I hated it. And I was really unhappy, right? And I would just come home from work like so stressed out. And I hit this total crisis point. And I was like, what's wrong? And then, and then I was like, oh yeah. It's like February and last September, God gave me a really clear commission to go start teaching Hebrew classes in North Battleford and Prince Albert in Saskatoon. And I thought it was a great idea and I was really excited and I told Genevieve all about it, but then I didn't do anything with that. And now I'm freaking out and I'm miserable. And I know why. It's because I dropped the baton. That kind of idea, eh? So, you know what? There are times when if we don't treat God as holy and we don't listen to Him, our lives are just going to crash and burn. Something that this story tells us. The story tells us that even though God is like a really loving dad and we can climb up on his lap and we can cuddle with him and he's really kind and merciful and patient and forgiving and stuff, there's also the side to him that's kind of like tough love. Like, uh, you know how parents discipline their kids? And then the last thing this tells us about God is just that like, and this is something we already covered, but that it, it wasn't Moses that chose Joshua. It was God who called Joshua and ultimately it was God who who like chose Joshua to influence his nation to, uh, to go before them at the head of them, right? And here's the last question in this story. We can, we can ask ourselves about this story. Um, you know what the name of Jesus is in Hebrew, right? Like what he was actually called? What is it? Push. Megan, do you know what it was? Do you know what? Do you know what the name of Jesus was in Hebrew? Like what his mom called him when he was growing up and stuff? Yeshua. That's right, we call him Yeshua, right? And Yeshua is the short form of the name Joshua, which in Hebrew is Yehoshua. Everybody say, Yehoshua. Now that's Joshua. And then if you say that the short form, it's Yeshua. And that's what the Messiah himself was called. Wow. So do you think there might be a couple like parallels between Joshua and Yeshua, the Messiah? Oh yeah, so I just want to look at a couple of those with you to uh, finish, our, finish our thoughts about this story today. Because we love Yeshua, He's captured our hearts, He's our, our groom who's returning for us. And uh, everything in the scriptures is designed to tell us about Him and to exalt Him. Um, one of the th similarities we see is just like Joshua was chosen by God to lead the nation, Yeshua was chosen by God to become the King of Israel, to lead the nation, and to be like our leader as a bunch of disciples. Uh, we also see in this story how Joshua was called to be transparent, to be available, to come in and go out before the people. Is that true of Yeshua? I mean, okay, Yeshua, he lifted off of planet Earth almost 2,000 years ago. And like he's sitting at his father's right hand in the heavens, like administrating the universe with his father. That's a pretty big job, isn't it? 
he's probably really busy. But is he available too if you need to talk with him? Or if you want to see what he's all about? Is he around to like show himself to you? Yeah, totally. So that's something that we see in, in this story. Um, remember how we talked about how that, that, that Hebrew idiom for leadership to, uh, to bring them out and to bring them back in? That means to like, to lead the nation in a battle? Is that true of Yeshua? Like, are we as people in a battle on planet Earth? Do we, are we fighting, let's say, the forces of darkness, sin, addiction, all kinds of junk, even in the city? Yeah, we totally are. And we totally see how Joshua led the nation of Israel and how Yeshua leads us in, uh, in combat. Actually, there was this, um, there's this one translation that I read of this story and I really liked it. Um, they used the expression to, uh, to show the people where to go and then to bring them back home. And I love that, that that's what Yeshua does with us. Like Yeshua shows us as individual disciples, as family units and as a community here in Prince Albert, He shows us where to go and He brings us back home. And I really love how He's doing that in our generation with how He's bringing us back home to uh, our heritage and God's covenants with Israel, uh, the Torah in general, uh, the Hebrew language. Yeshua is totally bringing His people home in that capacity also. Uh, Joshua, it says, God's Spirit was in him. And that's so true of Yeshua, hey? Like, uh, Paul even wrote that, like, God, everything that God is, was inside of Yeshua physically. So if, like, let's say that you lived down the street from Yeshua in Capernaum, and you got up in the morning and just looked over, and there he was sitting on the front step, you were, like, looking at a guy, and all of God was physically inside of Yeshua. That's how, like, how much of God's Spirit he had in him. <laughs> that's, that's a parallel that we see. Um, we see in this story that Joshua didn't just jump out and be like, Hey guys, I'm going to lead the nation now. No, that wasn't what happened, was it? Like, Joshua spent years and years in, um, you could say, in obscurity. Like, I don't know, maybe not a lot of people knew who Joshua was. He was just kind of that young guy that helped Moses out, that took care of Moses, and that was, the, that was, leading, that was um, learning from Moses, hey? And that was true of Yeshua, too. Yeshua, he spent the first 30 years of his life just living at home with his mom and his bros, working a construction job in a little town, kind of a little hick town, hey? So I, I, I love that parallel, that Yeshua and Joshua both spent years in obscurity, uh, years where they just lived life humbly, uh, years where they were learning to serve other people. And then finally, Joshua hit this point in his life where Moses said, Joshua, today is the big day. You're going to be standing up in, with me in front of a couple million people, and I'm going to put my hands on you, and I'm going to make you the new leader of the nation. You're going to be the general of the army. So whatever you tell the nation of Israel, they're going to do that. If you say, we got to go here, they will go here. If you say, time to jump, they'll say, how high? That kind of idea, hey? <clears throat> and that's very true of Yeshua also. Did you notice that Yeshua didn't put himself out there? Yeshua didn't say, hey guys, I decided that I'm going to, lead, I'm going to be the leader of the Jewish people. No, that, that's not at all what happened. Um, Yeshua's father called him, and then Yeshua's father chose him. And just like Moses laid his hands on Joshua and said, I am a true prophet of God. You've seen that from the miracles that God did through me. And now I am telling you and I'm showing you that Joshua is going to succeed me. That's true also of Yeshua. When you look at, the, when you look at Moses, here, let, let's think of it like this. If you could imagine Yeshua just standing there as like a carpenter, uh, uh, that kind of guy, right, from Nazareth. If you could imagine him standing here, you can see Moses behind him laying his hands on Yeshua. And you can see Yeshua fulfilling the prophecy of Moses. You can see Yeshua fulfilling, like where, where, for instance, where Moses said, one of your brothers is going to be a prophet like me. Listen to him in everything he says. Or when um, or you can see the prophet Micah standing behind Yeshua with his hands on him saying, the Messiah is going to be born in Bethlehem. Or you can imagine like the warrior king David with his hands on Yeshua saying things like, Messiah is going to die by having his hands and his feet pierced through. People are going to throw lots for Messiah's garments. People are going to give the Messiah vinegar to drink. One of his closest friends is going to betray him. Um, and, and on and on and on. Yeshua fulfilled so many prophecies that were made by the old prophets. And that's the idea. Just like Moses said, guys, you know that I'm a real prophet, and this is, this is Joshua, and God says he's your new leader. You see all of these prophets, and you can see them prophesying about Yeshua, and then there's prophecies um, definitely confirming Yeshua's call. And then the last thing is just, this is the most obvious one, the no-brainer. Joshua was the leader of Israel, and Yeshua is our leader. 
And that's really exciting because that means every one of us has a connection with him. Like, you can ask Yeshua, where do I go in life? What do you want me to do? And he'll talk to you. He'll lead you. He'll give you that direction that you need for your life. And um, that's one side of the equation, right? Every one of us has the connection. Every, every one of us knows Yahweh and can hear his voice. But did you know there's another side to it? Sometimes, if that's all we focus on, we can become very individualistic and we can become like anarchists. You know that phrase, everybody did what was right from their own perspective, what was right in their eyes? If, all we, if, if that's the only side that we think about, then that's what we become, right? We become anarchists. The other side of the equation is Yeshua, as the leader of his people, also, also um, he leads his people through his spirit. So if I see one of you and, and you have the gift of prophecy and God says something to you, I'm going to take that seriously. Yeshua may be leading us as a community through you. And there are lots of other gifts like that, right? So when we get together, we'll definitely see that God will prompt people. He will inspire people through His Spirit. And that's Yeshua leading us as a people. And there are specific like, people that act in certain leadership capacities. Uh, Paul listed some of those. There are apostles, there are prophets, there are teachers. We're the three big ones that Paul listed in his first letter to uh, the Yeshua disciples in Corinth. And so get this. Because this is something I think is very often just people don't get in the Hebrew Roots movement or in the Messianic Jewish community. Yes, you have your individual connection with God, but sometimes when it comes to community leadership, God will not let you know what He wants you to do. He will, like, okay, not as, a, not as an individual. He will not let you as, a, as an individual know what He wants the community to do or where He wants the community to go. He may not give you the vision. Why? Because there may already be people in the community that God has given those giftings to. So there might be someone in the community that's visionary. There might be someone that really hears God's voice. There might be a, someone who's passionate about teaching and true doctrine. And so you don't have to experience all that yourself. You just have to be like, hey, who's the apostle around here? Or who's the prophet? Or who's the teacher? You know, and go to that person and just say, you know, what, what's God saying? Where do you sense God wants us to go? And then trust that because that's Yeshua's way of leading a community, right? So can you guys see those two sides? They're the side where it's just him and you and it's very individualistic and that's wonderful. And there's also the side where Yeshua leads us as a community through people, right? And we need to trust those people, trust Yeshua's leadership through those people and take that seriously. So, so that is our story for today. Uh, those are some things that we learned from the story. Um, hopefully we can each take away at least one thing that's like, yeah, that really spoke to me. That's something where I can um, do my life a little bit differently or whatever. And uh, the last question I have for you is, who could you tell the story to this upcoming week? The story about an old leader who was going to climb a mountain and die, but who had to lay his hand on a young leader that was meant, he, had, he was mentoring first in a special ceremony in a public way an old leader who really cared about other people and wanted to make sure that they didn't just wander around like a bunch of lost sheep or something, and an old leader who prayed to God about that. Um, so it's a great story. Is there, is there someone that you could tell that story to? I think so. It's a pretty good story. It's pretty simple. And um, it's, a, it's a story from God's Word. So it's a story that will do something in people's lives, eh? Why? Because God's Word always does stuff in people's lives. So I want you to think about that right now. Like, who could you tell this story to in the upcoming week? And then, guess what? Next Shabbat, when we get together, we can tell stories about who we told the story to. Yeah. And, uh, and that should be cool. Because sometimes maybe God will use that to start a great conversation or to get someone's heart to open up. And they'll start talking to you about things that you would never have talked about otherwise. So that's going to be pretty sweet. Yeah. Could I pray for a moment? <clears throat> Yeah, Fa uh, Father, thank you that we can be out here in the park today. Uh, thank you for your word. Thank you for this true story about an old leader and a young leader. Thank you for how it tells us about Yeshua, our, our ultimate leader, uh, the man whom you have chosen to uh, live his life in front of us, um, the man with whom we have fallen in love, as it were. Um, thank you so much. I pray that we could see Yeshua more clearly, that we could follow him more passionately. I pray that you would continue to give us as a, a movement of Yeshua's disciples, leaders, Father. And I pray that you would show us um, either someone that we can begin to mentor or someone that you want to mentor us, Father. I pray that you would, you would show us that. Who could we influence or who could we let influence us more? And uh, thank you for it. Thank you so much. We love you today, and uh, we're really excited about following Yeshua in this upcoming week. Amen. Thank you for joining us in this message. I pray that it's been an inspiration to you in your discipleship to Yeshua the Messiah. 
Crown of Messiah is a relatively small congregation with a massive mission. We're not just making disciples and teaching the Word of God here in our city. We're also doing that internationally through vehicles such as the internet. It is our joy to offer you these messages for free at absolutely no charge. At the same time, we do have ongoing overhead expenses. It costs us something to produce these teachings and get them out to you. And we would appreciate it if you would, in turn, support our work in a practical way. Help us cover some of our basic expenses. You can do that by going to our website, crownofmessiah.com, and going to the donate page where you can make a one-time donation or you can set up a monthly automated donation. I'm reminded of the words of Yeshua's Apostle Paul in Galatians chapter 6. He said, Let the one who is taught the word share everything good with his teacher. So, if you're being taught the word by us, we would appreciate it if you would take the words of Yeshua's Apostle seriously and make some type of return for the blessing that we are giving you for free. That way, we'll all be in it together and we will be a team accomplishing the mission that Yeshua has given us. And you will go from only being a receiver to also being a giver. If you're like most people, finances are tight. We understand that. Finances are tight for us too. That's why we need people like you to come alongside us and to back us in the work that Yeshua has called us to do. Thank you so much for making that donation at crownofmessiah.com and thank you for becoming a team member with us. We appreciate it.